you. I am so privileged to be here to talk with you today about a very valuable lesson I've learned in my life. And that is the power of using not only your voice, but also your feet to change the world. I'm sure you all have had this experience where you stood in the shoes of someone whom you admired very much. I know that my daughters did this when they were growing up, and I'm so grateful that their feet actually outgrew my shoes, or I would probably not have any left in my closet. <laughs> but we all have this remarkable power in our shoes. And of course, it's not about our shoes. It's about the journeys that we've taken in them. It's about our capacity not only to carry with us in our hearts and in our passions the experiences that we've had in our own shoes, but those that we've seen from walking in the shoes of others. This idea of walking in the shoes of others and how important it's been in forming the policies and the passions of people in the history of this country cannot be overstated. Women gained the right to vote 95 years ago because we relied on men to step into our shoes to understand why giving us the right to vote was so tremendously important. Giving us a voice at the ballot box mattered so very, very much. The story goes that the last congressional holdout on this vote was told by his mother if he did not vote for it, he should not come home for dinner ever again. <laughs> And of course, this need for us to stand in the shoes of others, to fight on each other's behalf based on our shared and non-shared experiences is just as important today as it ever was. The Black Lives Matter movement speaks so powerfully to this. These words, I can't breathe. The last words of Eric Garner as he died in a chokehold at the hands of the police. Words that invite us to consider his experience, his pain, and to step forward in a powerful way, a movement that grew out of his experience that asked us each to step into his shoes and the shoes of so many others like him and to understand in a profound and important way that black lives matter. This is the Earl Warren Supreme Court. This court, famous for many remarkable and seminal decisions in our country's history, not the least of which was Brown versus Board of Education that desegregated our public schools. But who were these nine white, relatively conservatively raised men who came to put themselves into the shoes of young black Americans and to understand the importance of an equal education for them. When you look at their shoes, you notice something, right? They all look the same. They're all men. They're wearing pretty much the same shoes. They're all white. They've probably had fairly similar experiences in their lives. So what was it about them, and in particular, what was it about this man, Earl Warren, who was appointed to the court in a recess appointment, by the way, when a justice died suddenly and unexpectedly in the middle of the night, Fred Vinson, sound familiar, correct? <laughs> Eisenhower appointed Warren to the Chief Justice position after Chief Justice Vinson's death. It is rumored that later Eisenhower said that this was the most awful decision that he made as president, although I would argue it was the most important and profound and good thing he did. Earl Warren, who himself understood the importance of stepping into the shoes of this little girl, Ruby Bridges, as she walks into her classroom for the first time in Louisiana, two years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, because Louisiana, like so many southern states, was resisting the court order, accompanied here by marshals as her first friends on her first school day there. What was it about Earl Warren that gave him the capacity to walk into her shoes and to fight for her? Many people believe that it was his experience as the Attorney General before becoming Governor of California that set who he became. 
Earl Warren was tasked with carrying out FDR's order to inter Japanese Americans during World War II for no crime that they'd committed for no reason other than the fact that they were of Japanese descent. And he talks in his autobiography about the fact that when he toured those camps and he saw the human indignities that his own actions had wrought, tearing families apart from one another, imprisoning people for doing nothing wrong, it had a remarkable and indelible impact on him that he carried forward with him for the remainder of his life. Justice Anthony Kennedy, as you know, the majority opinion writer in the recent Obergefell marriage equality decision. Raised Irish Catholic, very conservative family, obviously heterosexual. What was it about him that provided him the capacity to write these words? to understand that the plaintiffs were asking for equal dignity in the eyes of the law and to rely upon and believe in a constitution that guaranteed them that right. Many people believe that it was his friendship with this individual, Gordon Schaber, who was the dean of the law school that Anthony Kennedy once taught at. A very powerful friendship developed between these two men. And Gordon Schaber was gay. Many believe that it was because of that friendship that he was able to write and to understand why that dignity should be apportioned to everyone, even people like his friend Gordon. Now, sometimes we find ourselves standing in the shoes of people that we would otherwise never choose to stand in. And I think these two women would tell you that story. Bushra Awad and Robbie Damlin are from warring states of Israel and Palestine, and each of them has lost a beloved son to that conflict. In their shared grief, they have forged an amazing friendship, one that has fought to find change and to use their experiences for some good. When I heard them speak at the Women in the World Conference in New York a couple of years ago, I couldn't help but notice their shoes. Each of them wearing black and white Converse tennis shoes, a literal representation of the fact that they are walking in each other's shoes. This is the uniform footwear of 600 families from Palestine and Israel who have formed a coalition to speak out about their shared pain and to try to use it to forge peace. Now on the day two years ago in the Texas Senate when I stood on that floor for 13 hours, it may be that I was wearing those pink tennis shoes in that particular moment. But before that, I had walked many steps myself and I'd watched my family, my grandmother, my mother, and so many others, and I that day not only was carrying their journeys and their stories with me in those shoes, I was carrying the stories of thousands of women who were asking us to listen to them in that vote. This, my maternal grandmother, Native American, poor her entire life, understood the double sting of both poverty and racism. She wore a pair of her mother's old lace-up, leather, low-heeled, sturdy shoes to elope and get married in when she was only 13 years old and only sixth grade educated to my grandfather who was 15 years old and only fourth grade educated. Between the two of them, they had 14 children. They didn't own a home until they went on social security. They were tenant farmers their entire lives. And they struggled, and they struggled with the deep understanding that comes from not having had an education and what that can mean. My own mother, only ninth grade educated, became the sole support for me and my three siblings when my parents divorced when I was very young. She worked at Brahms Ice Cream and Dairy Store and never made very much, and we struggled as a family. And I have such strong memories of her, of course, in this orange and white uniform. 
But more than that, what I remember are her shoes. The orthopedic comfort shoes that so many women in this country wear who wait tables, who work incredibly hard to try to provide for themselves and their families and whose shared struggles they want us to know about, whose shoes they'd want us to walk in. My own story as a very young mom I became pregnant when I was 18. This is my oldest daughter, Amber, who's 33 today and expecting my first grandchild. We struggled through the same experiences that I watched my grandmother and my mother struggle with. I feared that I was never going to be able to put my foot on the path of higher education and that I was going to find myself trapped in the same poverty of generations before me. And I knew the fear of that poverty. I knew what it meant to come home to have my lights not work because I couldn't pay my light bill or the phone turned off. But it was two things that pushed me forward. One was access to a community college, affordable community college education near my home, which ultimately led me to Harvard Law School. But the other, and equally as important to me, was the reproductive health care that I received at a Planned Parenthood clinic near my home. The only place that I received care for about four years, and without which I likely would have had a second unplanned pregnancy, which would have completely derailed my ability to create a better life for myself and my daughter. I've had two filibusters in my life. One was on education funding, and the other was on reproductive access. So you can understand now the stories I carried with me when I put those shoes on that day. So what about you? You are an extraordinary generation, more so, I believe, than any generation before you. You care so very much about the world around you, and you talk and are active in trying to make changes every single day. You want more than any generation before you to have a positive effect on the world. And when you're asked what's important to you and your priorities, of course you say family, you say home, but you also talk about doing for others in a way that's truly unparalleled. We see that in so many actions that your generation has taken and that inspire people like me to believe that the world is going to do nothing but get better. In the right upper right of this screen, Emma Sulkowitz, a Columbia University student who has since graduated, but who, while she was at Columbia, suffered a sexual assault on this very mattress, the mattress that she's carrying with her. And when the administration ignored her pleas for a response, she took it upon herself to carry this mattress with her every single day for the rest of her junior year and throughout her senior year. A plea to say, look at what happened to me. Do not ignore me. And also to stand in a way that said, I'm not going to allow this to happen to someone else. In the lower right, Sadie Hernandez, a young woman from the Rio Grande Valley in Texas who took it upon herself to stand outside the governor's mansion and to protest cuts to Planned Parenthood's breast cancer screen program. She stood there for day after day after day after day, much longer than I stood on the one day of my filibuster. And she was joined by people every day, a growing group of people who understood the need to speak out and up on behalf of the women whose health would be impacted by that decision. And of course, as we spoke about a moment ago, the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been joined by people black and white and brown and other, who are speaking up and out on behalf of a growing awareness and understanding about what's not happening in the criminal justice system in this country. What was so powerful about what happened in Texas two years ago had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with the thousands of people who made a pilgrimage to the Capitol that day. 
this photo taken in our Capitol Dome on that day. And if you look closely at it, you'll see it's filled with young people. The Capitol had to be closed for the first time in its history because it filled to capacity. And at the end of that day, it wasn't me who successfully carried that filibuster over the midnight deadline. It was the thousands of people who came who literally about 15 minutes before midnight used their voices in as powerful a way as they could use them, literally screaming out until they successfully got the bill killed after midnight. So imagine what might be different if we empowered ourselves in two important ways, if we continued not only to consider our own life experiences, the shoes that we wear, the journeys that we've had in them, but if we tried on others' shoes for a while. This is a lesson that I have learned as a state legislator, the importance of listening to people whose perspectives are very, very different from my own and working to forge some consensus to create a better world. It's about putting ourselves in each other's shoes to assure that we will do that. But it's also about putting ourselves in the shoes of people who need a voice. This photo is so poignant to me because, of course, it's a reflection of Emma Solkowitz on a happier day a day of her graduation when not only was she continuing to carry that mattress, but when she was joined by fellow students who literally picked it up, carried it with her, helped her with her burden. So think about this photo again for a moment. What's different today? Of course, those particular feet belonging to none other than the notorious. <laughs> Can you imagine history without her shoes and the shoes of some of the other folks in this photo? And when you think about and reflect upon the changes that have been made because we have a diversity of experiences on that court now, a diversity of journeys that have walked in a diversity of shoes, consider what history would be without them. And what I want to leave you with is the power that you each have in an incredibly important way. And that, of course, is at the ballot box. You see, you're the yellow line here. I'm somewhere in that blue and purple line. The folks who are older like I am are the ones who are coming out in much greater percentages of our population to vote. And you can understand then why we have an outsized influence on what the candidates feel they have to speak to. And not only that, but what the folks who get elected feel that they have to work on, the policies that they pursue. They're thinking about the blue and the purple people. You have the power to make sure that they think about your values, the shoes you stand in, and the fights and experiences that you carry forward on behalf of other people. It gets even more sobering when you look at what happens in mid-year election turnout, where the gap between older voters and younger voters gets even greater. But there is so much hope if you will exercise your voices in one of the most important and powerful ways that you possess. In 2008, you occupied 20% of the overall voting population in this country. But by 2020, just four years away, you will occupy 40% of that voting population. Imagine the difference you could make if candidates felt that they had to speak to your values, your concerns, if, better yet, people who were elected felt that they had to reflect the things that you care about. And even better yet, if you are the people who are running for office and filling those offices yourself. I truly believe that each and every one of us has the power to do remarkable things. And I hope that I have left you with some encouragement about the remarkable power that each of you possesses and that if you will use your voice and use your feet, 
you truly can and will change the world. Thank you very, very much.